Okay, we're talking about Theology of the Body today. Uh, Theology of the Body was um, recently brought to us by St. John Paul the Great when he was Pope. Uh, he made this huge um, book series. I don't even know how to explain it. And we're going to just brush over a piece of it today because it's so intense. Um, but the moment that you come into this world, the moment you come bursting out of your mom's womb, you are craving love. You're just seeking out love, wanting to be held by your parents or by anyone, anyone that will love you. Uh, and then in, in us, we have this innate desire, innate <coughs> desire to be loved and to want to love on others. <coughs> Something that um, people joke about marriage being a downfall is that you have the old ball and chain, like you lose your freedom and you're restricted and you're tied down the rest of your life. Um, and I think that is one of... The opposite of that is, um, or one of my favorite things in married life has been the freedom that I've experienced being married to Joe. Uh, actually, in this place is when I realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life with Joe. Uh, when we were dating, it was after our first date, actually. So, um, but it was just like a beautiful place to experience a beautiful moment. We didn't actually get married in there because Joe has this huge family and they won't fit us in there. Um, but anyway, one of the things with freedom is uh, I'm reminded of this moment this summer. I was at the pool with my mom, and we're really close, and I'm reading this book called The Good News About Sex and Marriage uh, out in public, which was confusing to my mom. Like, what, how dare you? And uh, anyway, and so she asked the awkward question, how is married life? And this is my mom. I can actually answer her. So I say, you know what? I love it. It's great, and I love the sexual freedom that we experience in marriage. And my mom was like, what? <laughs> I was not expecting that answer, you know? Like, I did not know we were going to be talking about this. And I was like, yes, we are talking about it. Um, it is just amazing in married life to be united with someone in such an intimate way, to be able to break down these um, barriers, to be able to fully respect each other. And as Leah Darrow said, uh, to give fully of yourself and to receive that person fully in return um, is just one of my favorite things about being married. So this isn't going to be a talk about how sex is done and the birds and the bees, but um, we're going to be talking about our sexuality uh, and breaking that open a bit. Because there's a line this nursery rhyme misses. In between marriage and babies, there's sex. Like, that has to happen, unless your mother married. Um, the world has this perspective that your spirituality and your sex life should be completely split, or your sexuality. Uh, spirituality good, God good, well the world doesn't always call, call God good, but we picture God good. And sometimes we have this perspective that sexuality bad, body bad, sex bad, uh, and we kept, keep them separate. Um, almost as, like we often hear, uh, keep God out of the bedroom. But this is one thing that really you should bring together and have united because you are spiritual beings. You are body, mind, and spirit all in one. Not just a spirit floating around and you're not just a body with no purpose. God created you so that you could have this abundant life um, and be a spiritual being. Your sexuality is a gift. And because the world has this weird, skewed version um, perspective, we need to work on transforming our perspective and the world's. <coughs> now, how do we go about doing that? To prepare for this talk, I had to listen to um, a lot of smarter people than me. <laughs> One of them being Christopher West, the guy who's reading or write, wrote the book that I'm reading. Uh, and he had this uh, great topic that we're going to do for a little bit. Um, so obviously we know men and women are different, right? So we're going to do a quick exercise. Yes, I know that was shocking. Joe. Not Joe, my husband. Joe, that one. They're very confusing. Anyway. Uh, okay, women. Ready? You're going to sing a note with me. Ready? Oh, Sit up straight. Sit up straight. Breathe in. And sing. Oh. Very nice. 
very nice, obviously beautiful. Now the men sit up. Hi. Uh, yeah. That's not it. Oh, right. Don't worry, you don't have to hit that. Note. I don't know if I can hit your note though. Anyway. Alright, men will sing. Oh, mine's not as good. Yours is much better. Okay, ready? Now we're going to go at the same time. Remember, yours, women? Oh, wait, no, what was it? What was it? Oh, and then men. Oh. Ready? One, two, three. So ideally, this is more beautiful than just being one on its own. Because you both have your own purpose in that. In that creating that noise and creating that harmony. And you're made to uh, complement each other in that moment. So, now going back to the Bible, why did God create man and woman? Specifically, different beings. Yes? Populate the earth. Populate the earth, okay. That's good, be fruitful. What else? I don't know. Yeah, Liam. Companionship. What? Companionship. Companionship, good. To have relationships. Do we have any other thoughts? Love. Love, okay. So how do we see this in our relationship with God? God loves us. We know that. God wants relationship with us. And God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Because he, he created this deep union, and he wants to reflect that continuously um, throughout eternity. And again, we are uh, given that love from birth, um, or that desire to love and to be loved. And that continues to multiply as we grow up and try to discern how is God calling us. Was God created this order. And um, the way that our Bible is written, it's a love story love story between us and God. And the first words spoken by a human, uh, in this case a human man, are from Adam. After he's created all the, all the, or named all the animals um, that God has created, he doesn't actually speak until he sees Eve. Uh, and he says, at last, you are the one. You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In, the, in this moment, he is seeing her completely as God created her. Literally, taken from him and formed from his rib from his rib into a being and completely naked but in pure of spirit and he's seeing her and seeing that she compliments him that they are separate beings and totally to be um, they are to fulfill each other to be equals and to unify he finally sees the fulfillment of his being and his existence right there having God and his wife all in one. And in this moment, they feel naked, um, but no shame. Because at this point, they don't understand that they are naked. And um, he realizes more, this is how God loves, and this is how I am to love. Now in between, or right in the middle, we get to experience Jesus' life. Um, so this is just a quick excerpt when Jesus says to us, uh, I came so that you might have life and to live it abundantly. And um, we'll continue to see that as we move through our life with Jesus in the Bible. The last human word spoken uh, we get to see in Revelation. And this is when the bride and the spirit uh, meet Jesus and are uh, proclaiming him in his second coming, and they say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. Sorry, two hours. Anyway, so how beautiful is it that our existence is bookended by the wife and the husband and fulfilled completely in the middle by Jesus, God. It's this love story. Um, and right in the middle of that, we also have the Song of Solomon, which is a beautiful love letter, basically. Now, when you um, agree to your covenant, you agree with these terms. You agree that uh, you, will, you are entering into it free, um, freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully, and that's how you live it out. It's not just your covenant, it's in your sexuality, in your being. It's a long one, yeah? <laughs> Who said who? Uh, I love this reading when we were writing, or when we were 
reading through the book, making uh, readings for our wedding ceremony. Joe did not like a lot of the stereotypical <coughs> ones. And this is one of the ones that we both really loved because we prayed together when we were a couple. And so I encourage that. Uh, anyway, sorry, background. Tobit, uh, Tobias, asked to marry Hannah. And the night before they get married, they are drinking, having a rehearsal dinner, and the father says, she has been engaged to seven men, and they have all died the night before the wedding. But if you be the one that God intends, like, cheers, mate, you get her. Um, Brutal. <laughs> and so they get married. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like, die. Okay, we'll they were allowed to down. get married. Uh, God let, let it happen and let it be. And uh, as they are uh, led to their home and left by their parents, um, he asked her to kneel by the bed before joining with her and consummating and uh, asking her to pray. So they started to pray and beg that they might be protected. He began with these words, Blessed are you, O God of our ancestors. Blessed be your name forever and ever. Let the heavens and all your creation bless you forever. You made Adam and you made his wife Eve to be his helper and support. And from these two, the human race has come. You said it is not good for the man to be alone. Let us make him a helper like himself. Now, not with lust, but with fidelity, I take this kinswoman as my wife. Send down your mercy on me and on her, and grant that we may grow old together. Bless us with children. Do you see how he calls out free and total and faithful and fruitful in here? Children, right now. We know that one, Yanni. <laughs> Uh, we saw helper and support. Fidelity, yeah. So he's calling all this out, saying uh, he will honor God in this way and honor his covenant and his wife. And then they also reflected it back to Adam and Eve. So we're here to just break open this topic and discuss how it is in our life. How we can move from this point, always being renewed by Christ, and always seeking out that full and authentic desire to love and to be loved. Love is God loved. Uh, but while we're doing this, let's take a look at the world. The world has a certain view on sexuality. We see it a lot in magazines with, like, hottest man of the year, Matthew McCart, or not Matthew McCart, what's his name? McConaughey. McConaughey. That was probably like 10 years ago or so. <laughs> um, but they, we often hear, like, sex is the fun stuff. Just skip to that. Don't worry about the relationship. Um, don't worry about boundaries. You probably face social pressure and peer pressure in school. Um, during my high school years, I often had this argument with one of my best friends even that she did not understand why I was not sexually active with my long-term boyfriend, and she'd even say stuff like, why don't you just get it over with? Why don't you just do it? And if you've heard that too, hopefully you have a similar thought to me of it's not a game, it's not something to just get done and toss <coughs> aside. Um, but that's sometimes what the world tells us, right? Everyone's doing it. And so sometimes we have to remember, not everyone's doing it. Sometimes it's a, uh, a right into manhood or womanhood, or it feels that way. The world tells us that we can have as much sex as we want because there's contraception to protect you from mistakes or uh, diseases. We also know that we live in a world where uh, there's a lot of temptation, and we see that in pornography. We see that even as we walk around, and, or if you <coughs> dress immodestly, or if you're tempted by someone, pressure to be sexy um, and live a promiscuous life. Uh, now there are some pitfalls to sex outside marriage. Some of these are even sex in marriage, like adultery. Um, but having sex with someone that you're not fully unified with in Christ, in marriage, uh, it could help your, hurt your self-esteem. Uh, you could feel used or abused. You could actually be abused or raped. Um, we mentioned a little bit that pregnancy is a possible outcome, um, possibly unwanted 
pregnancies if you're outside of marriage and that fear of having a baby outside of marriage. Um, you may develop false attachments if you make excuses maybe and you know that this is a long-term significant other and that you'll probably marry them so it doesn't matter. I know I heard that lie a lot after being with someone for five years and that was a major temptation. Um, we also have being treated as an object. Oh, here we have Leah Darrow again, though. And I love this quote because uh, it just helps you to live out uh, genuine relationships. So she says, authentic love will never ask you to lie. will never send you to a confession line. And just with this thought, I invite you to allow prayer into your relationships. Um, asking that you pray together with your significant other. Because it can be very fruitful. We can hold each other accountable. Now, it is sometimes hard to say no after a while. There's a breaking point to no. Uh, Joe actually helped me think of some examples, but I'm going to go with candy. Because I have a problem with candy. It's like a love affair. And uh, we just had Halloween, so we didn't have enough trick-or-treaters at our house, honestly. There were 26. It was pretty pathetic. And we had tons of candy left over. And I just kept eating it. Joe kept eating it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it was the bus. And it, it's just a, like a major temptation to me. After a while, it's hard because it's there to say, no, I don't need it. No, I'll spoil my ap appetite. Uh, no, it's unhealthy to eat this whole box of candy. Um, but you know what? There's more power into yes. You get more empowered by saying yes, but what are you saying yes to? And so being able to evaluate um, where do you want to invest your yes? Now, if we're thinking about uh, candy, maybe I want to say yes to a salad. <laughs> No, um, yes to giving out candy to my coworkers, right? We always have candy around the office, so I could take it there and give it out so that everyone could be happy and not just me with a stomach ache. But let's now drop over to our sexuality. What can we say yes to that would be more empowering than saying no? So with sexuality, maybe a no is limiting when you're saying, no, I don't want to right now. That's setting a time limit, kind of, a limit to yourself or a limit to your partner. And they're thinking outside of the, those boundaries. You can say no to a certain line. And then that just makes gray area. But then, if we want to empower our sexuality, because it is a gift from God and a gift to us, what well, are the things we could say yes to? You could say yes to my future covenant. Yes to praying for myself. Praying for my future spouse, maybe. That was a strategy I took. Yes to a deeper relationship with God. Yes to chastity. It's like choosing those more positive things. Like a way to adapt your thinking. And because we're so bombarded by the things of this world, it's going to be, it's going to be more difficult sometimes to say no than it will be to say yes. <coughs> 